What is going on guys? Welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video and we begin today's episode with a little job that I didn't intend on, you know, making a video about and that was deorbiting this little booster here. It's from my small space station video where we built a micro scale space station in low carbon orbit and I left one of the insertion boosters stuck in space. I, I forgot to deorbit it and I, uh, I had fitted a probe core and batteries and all that so that it could deorbit itself and parachutes for it to, you know, land. But as you can see, I didn't actually include, or I didn't leave enough fuel left in it. It didn't actually have enough Delta V to get back to Kerbin. So I considered making like a little rocket. Here's one of the prototype rockets. I, just, I considered getting it using a rocket and deorbiting it that way. But I thought, you know what? This is a good opportunity to make a little SSTO, you know? I really like making the Mark 1 scale SSTOs using the fighter jet components. I really like the... Uh, I really like the aesthetic of this kind of aircraft design, but I don't make many aircrafts of this sort of scale. So, what better opportunity to do this than this opportunity here? So that's what we're doing in today's video. And to be honest, I think using an SSTO for this mission is actually quite a good fit because, you know, conventional rockets in Kerbal Space Program, at least the uh, the non-recoverable ones, do end up polluting things in some way, usually in the form of crashing uh, spent boosters into the ocean or into the land or something like that. Uh, they're not very, you know, environmentally conscious, but an SSTO is fully recoverable. We won't be dumping anything anywhere, hopefully, if the flight goes to plan. So I guess it's kind of good that it's it's in fitting with the um, with the philosophy of this mission that we want to keep things clean and uh, debris free. So that's what we'll go with. And I've, I decided to bring, uh, you know, Jebediah, Bob and Bill along with this mission because I thought it'd be nice to uh, pay a visit to the small space station. So uh, check on how the Kerbals are doing, make sure there's, uh, I don't know, no complications in the mission, like there's no coronavirus cases reported on the space station, that sort of thing. So it's, uh, it's going to be a nice... Well, that's our, oh, there's our couples there, looking excited at the mission ahead of them. That's a little summation of what we're about to do in this video. So we're going to be doing some deep space cleanup, followed by a small visit to the small space station. So, uh, you know, I've, I've obviously I've done more ambitious missions in the past, but, you know, I am, um, sometimes it's nice to just sort of slow the pace down a little bit and do something slightly more relaxing. Not necessarily super easy, but not super difficult either. In fact, what's funny is that this, um, in fact, I'm going to talk about the quick, I'm going to quickly discuss the SS2 Ascent Profile before, you know, going off on my, my rambling tangents once again. Uh, we're going for basically holding about, between about 20 and 30 degrees on the nav ball. Sometimes with my, you know, with my really big inefficient SSTOs, well, it's, I guess it's a mistake to call them inefficient SSTOs, but my SSTOs with much poorer thrust to weight ratio, I tend to say, we'll just fly flat at sea level until we reach 440 meters per second, which is the point at which the rape has become a lot more powerful. However, as you can see, this thing has excellent TWR. We can hit that magical 440 meter per second barrier during the ascent. That's why I was able to have a quite an aggressive ascent profile just here. And then, you know, once we hit the 20 kilometer mark, I fired up the nuclear engine to complement our uh, thrust because now we're getting to the very tenuous parts of the atmosphere. Those rapiers don't have much air to, um, you know, supplement their liquid fuel. And now they've entered closed cycle mode, so we can burn off our very small amount of oxidizer. We've only got 220 units, but it's enough because we can pick up most of our speed using the hyper-efficient air breathing mode of those rapier engines. And now that we're out of the thickest parts of the atmosphere, the nuclear engine, while, you know, does have a fairly poor thrust to weight ratio, is still powerful enough to get us the rest of the way to orbit. No problem. The only thing I don't like about this, the design of this SSTO, because I think, you know, I really like how it came out. It's nice and simple, nice and simple looking, but it looks sleek nonetheless. The only thing I don't like is the junior docking port on the front does look a bit dumb, <laughs> like how it's just that flat-nosed thing. It'd be kind of nice if you could get a shielded junior-sized docking port in this game. In fact, because you can get like a normal-sized docking port with a shield that can be deployed. Maybe it'd be nice for the for a squad at some point to add a shielded uh, senior docking port and a shielded uh, junior docking port as well. But, you know, they probably won't, let's be real. But if I could make one improvement to this SSTO, it'd be something like that. I mean, I guess... I could have fitted a, um, a uh, what's it called, a junior docking port to the back of this SSTO, but I thought for simplicity's sake it would make sense to have uh, a junior docking port along its center of mass. Just when it comes to deorbiting the booster, obviously we're going to be using this SSTO as the thrust object, you know, to propel it. So you want to make sure that the centers of mass all line up and the control of the vessel remains, you know, 
control. <laughs> if we weren't going to be deorbiting the uh, you know this booster just here, I wouldn't have bothered using the junior size docking port either. We would have used the claw if you know the booster itself didn't have a docking port on it. Or the most preferable option would have been to either, I guess, <laughs> have a shielded normal size docking port on the nose of this vessel, or indeed the inline docking port. You know, in the Mark II space plane series, you know the the, the SR-71-esque looking ones, you've got that shielded docking port that can open up a little hatch and extend out. There's actually one for the Mark I sized parts as well, though I, I, I see that get used a lot less frequently than the, uh, the Mark II one, I guess because the Mark II SSCOs just look so much cooler. <laughs> but I, I do have a soft spot for the Mark I scale pieces. Uh, but there is a shielded docking port that's in line with the Mark I fuselage, so I might have used that instead but you know we've got to work with uh, what we've got and what we've got is a piece of debris with a junior docking port on it i mean it was lucky to be fair it was lucky that it even had a junior docking port on it at all or i guess any docking port on it because um it's just a booster usually you'd use a decoupler for boosters or indeed you know the actual payload would just be attached to the booster via a docking port like docking ports can be undocked um, without needing to be attached to another docking port, if that makes sense. If you take just a booster and attach another piece to it via a docking port, you can undock that docking port like a decoupler. Uh, obviously, you can't redock it afterwards, but for the sake of, you know, a booster stack, that's irrelevant because the booster won't be recovered. Or, you know, the booster won't fulfill any other role in the mission, so it doesn't need to be redocked to anything. Uh, so I'm not really sure why I put <laughs> a docking port on this booster, but I guess I'm glad I did, obviously, because now we can actually uh, make sure it doesn't get left in space. We can deorbit it and keep space nice and clean. What you may have seen me do just then, by the way, was the uh, the quote-unquote lawn lazy method of docking, which is where you can just get both uh, both your targets to automatically dock to each other automatically really easily without the need for monitor propellants or anything like that. Most of you are probably familiar with this uh, you know, method of docking at this point, but for those that aren't, I'll quickly go over it in case, you know, the footage didn't do an adequate job of explaining how it worked. Essentially, you start with the ship that you are piloting. Uh, you double-click the docking port you would like to dock to to set it as your target. Then you press the target button on the nav ball to automatically hold that trajectory. You then switch to the thing you want to dock it to and do the same thing. So make sure your control point is the docking port or something in the same you know, line as the docking port, which in this case it was, it's the probe core. Uh, yep, so <laughs> with this booster, I then just double clicked the docking port on the SSTO and then got this thing to hold uh, target automatically as well. And then we could just puff the SST towards it at very slow speeds and the craft effortlessly maintain alignment and docking is a doddle. And that's the main part of the mission done. But I thought it might be nice, you know, we've got a small scale SSTO. It might be nice to pay pay a visit to the small scale space station, which is obviously, you know, the whole f purpose of that booster that we've just got rid of was to get the space station into orbit. Let's see how let's see how the fellas are getting on. So that's what we're gonna do for the uh, the latter part of this mission. It's kind of funny actually. The, today's video wasn't actually supposed to be this mission. Basically, I've been working on Destination Juno. Well, actually, to give you the full story, everything has been quite busy this week for me. Uh, I'm preparing to have quite a lot of building work done on the house, and a few things have gone wrong in the house as well. Um, not outside of that, we had problems with the roof of the house started leaking, and then the roof of the garage, which is like a separate building, started leaking, and then the shower broke. And just a few things have been happening. And I'm trying to prepare for the builders to come around and destroy my kitchen effectively. So I've got to try and take steps to make sure we still have some sort of functional you know, space to prepare meals. So I've assembled, I, I've assembled some temporary shelves in the living room and stuff to store all of our pots and pans and plates and all that good stuff. And just, you know, preparing these like dismantling some of the furniture and units and workbenches that are there at the moment in preparation for the builders to come around. So there's a lot of stuff that needs doing. Now, the result of all this, so far I've established a space station in low Juno orbit. We've built a surface base on the surface of Juno, unsurprisingly. We've put a massive rover down there as well. And uh, then we've put, we've sent the crew to the space station in low Juno orbit. And we've also attached some Duna descent SSTO space planes. They can get the crew to and from the surface. So I wanted to get the crew down to the surface. That was what we, this week's video is going to be. I'm actually going to pause this story and uh, resume it in just a second. Because I noticed the space station looks a bit odd. 
Like it doesn't look it like it's in its final form. Like I left it at the end of the video where we built it. So I must have inadvertently accidentally reloaded an old quick save or something like that. And as a result, it's got things like the uh, assembly boosters are still attached and obscuring the docking port that we need access to. And, uh, you know, the solar panels aren't extended and those are the kinds of solar panels that can't retract. So clearly something went wrong. So we need to check on the Kerbals, make sure they're all okay. They must have entered some sort of time warp. They're probably, you know, or, you know, a time anomaly, I guess. Uh, they're probably traumatized. We need to get Jeb, Bob and Bill to go and uh, see how they're getting on. So that's what this mission has now become a something of a rescue mission. Uh, I don't know if it's enough to uh, say it's a Blunderbirds mission. I could probably play the intro and then... On a lonely planet, slowly spinning its way to damnation. Actually, uh, that's not... It's too late. I guess it's too late now to establish this as a Blunderbirds episode. <laughs> and to be fair, I'm not actually going to be, quote-unquote, rescuing these Kerbals. Like, they're still going to be on board the space station. I just want to do, like, a, a quick psych evaluation, make sure you know they are, you know, mentally all okay and all there. Or as all there as, you know, a Kerbal can possibly be. Uh, so that's what, that's what we're going to do for this part of this mission now. So uh, it's I haven't got any monopolent on this space plane. And I, I thought there was a junior docking port on this side of the space station. And I also didn't quite uh, eyeball the trajectory of the space plane quite right. And I nearly uh, destroyed some stuff as I got a bit too close for comfort to that capsule just there. So what you'll see me now is just fumbling around trying to get a nice dock. And I did cheat a little bit by... Uh, manipulating the positioning of the space station, which I don't really like doing when docking things to space stations. But you know what? I didn't want this mission to go on too long or as long longer than it possibly needed to go on for, so I decided to take a few shortcuts. Anyway, like I was saying before I started talking about, you know, the problems I've had with this space station, apparently. Uh, this week's episode was supposed to be, you know, a continuation of Destination Juna. So I recorded the footage and all that for the Kerbals entering an SSTO from the Juna space station and descending down and uh, doing a controlled flight towards the ground base and landing right next to it. It was really, really satisfying. But I felt like that wasn't really enough footage for one episode. But I didn't really have enough time to plan out kind of a big epic rover expedition or lots of surface activities like in the similar sort of style to Expedition Eve's surface activities episode. It was taking a bit too much planning. I didn't really have that much time. So I thought maybe I could just do like some odd errands that I've been procrastinating doing. And one of them was, you know, getting rid of that booster in low carbon orbit. Uh, but then I realized it didn't have enough fuel left in it. So then I thought, you know what, let's to get the SSTO and we'll build it. No, I, that's what I was going to say. I, I designed rockets at first and we'll deorbit it using a rocket and then I thought you know what it actually might be more fun to do an SSTO mission because I haven't done an SSTO in a while and it's a bit more like I said in the spirit of keeping space clean and it sort of became this big mission and then I just decided you know what this is actually quite a fun mission to do this is now going to be this week's video and we'll uh, wait for just Destination Junior I'll wait, I'll wait till I've got a bit more time to make the Destination Junior episode a little bit more you know contained like it's just a Juno mission there's not just a random SSTO mission tacked onto it as well and, uh, you know, then I think it can really sort of do that series a bit more justice as well. So that's kind of how this episode, well, I guess how this video came to be, I suppose. So we sent our engineer out, that's Bill, <laughs> to uh, go and activate all of the stuff that wasn't activated on the space station to so that little uh, uh, chicken wheel <laughs> that's got the mystery goo units on it. Uh, serves absolutely no purpose other than, you know, aesthetics, although I guess that describes a Kerbal Space Station perfectly. Uh, KSB space stations don't really have any point other than just looking good. They do serve a kind of purpose for career mode and science mode when you're just trying to farm science points, but, you know, because of the lab module. But the lab module is so exploitative and very overpowered that I don't really like using it. And I know a lot of players um, don't like using it either for that reason. Like, it kind of takes away some of the satisfaction of science mode and career mode because you can just use the lab to farm science. Uh, but that is a legitimate reason to use a space station in Kerbal Space Program. And I guess, actually, they are quite good for as refueling outposts as well and, you know, for detecting mining sites. But things like this one, at least. This space station is the exemplification of an aesthetic-only station. But there it goes. Goodbye. Goodbye. Maybe I'll put like a card on screen or something or a link in the description or something like that so you guys can watch the video in which I built that small space station. It's still a, I really like that. I really liked that mission. It was kind of fun and satisfying to pull off. I really like, you know, the easier missions, to be, to be honest. There's a common theme here, isn't there? But there's something satisfying about a mission that, you know, just everything just works. 
Like, I don't know, my 208C ELO SSTO mission that had no refueling or all that, whilst impressive and I'm really satisfied with the end result, wasn't really that fun to do. Like, it was a lot of meticulous planning. I had to go into it and it was very, oh, so much planning and playing around with maneuver nodes for hours to just get like one gravity assist and then it doesn't even work. This mission, like, there were no quick loads throughout this entire mission. It was just great. Everything worked and it was easy. And it was just a fun mission to do. So I, it's sometimes nice to just, you know, have a bit of fun in video games. Wouldn't you agree? I realized just then, actually, I was about to, I was definitely going to overshoot the KSE. So I quickly did a small puff uh, retrograde before we started hitting the thicker parts of the atmosphere to make sure we'd, uh, you know, impact the ground soon enough. And then we started losing control because I'd forgotten to reactivate my control surfaces. Hence that initial slight spin. But now we're back under control. And uh, I guess we could start flying down towards the KSC runway. And that pretty much wraps this episode. We've barely got enough time for a whiskey review, which of course is what these this, these videos are all about, to be honest. Today's whiskey review will be... Uh, uh, I haven't thought this through. Oh god, I completely forgot this is a whiskey review series now. We're going to review... Uh... Southern Comfort. Awful. It's not even whiskey. It's like they took whiskey and then they just added things that aren't whiskey. And they, it's awful. It's terrible. It's not even whiskey. Why it's so popular, I don't understand. Southern Comfort, f*** you. <laughs> I hate you. I don't like it. Zero out of ten. One out of ten. It will get you drunk. And it will help you forget about the horrible taste of Southern Comfort. It's got that going for it. So there we are. That's that. Thank you for watching today's whiskey review, everyone. <laughs> Southern Comfort, the, the 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 liquefied sugar that pretends to be a whiskey, was uh, this was, was what this video was about. Anyway, on screen there are links on the left hand side. This is just another video that YouTube decided you might like. I don't know. And the one on the right is my most recent upload. Now I'm sad because I'm thinking about Southern Comfort. I'm just going to go. Bye. <laughs>